I'm Becca Hilburn. I am a comic artist and I went to UNO for my undergraduate degree in hypermedia and I went to SCAD for my graduate degree in comics. So I have an MFA in comics and what I'm going to teach you guys today is stuff that I learned from SCAD and I learned from other artists and I learned from writing a art supply review blog, natasubdevblogspot.com, and doing a YouTube channel where I teach people how to do different arty, comic-y things. So um, I brought loads of cool materials for you guys to play with, but I do want to introduce a few of these concepts beforehand, and that way we can all start on the same page. And if you are here hoping I'm going to talk about digital inking, I can. Y'all can totally interrupt me to ask me questions, um, but the focus is more traditional because that's what I do most of. All right, so we're going to be talking about tools, inks, and papers today. And we're going to start with brushes. Have any of you guys inked with a brush before? Oh, awesome. Y'all are cool. What kind of brushes have y'all used? I honestly don't entirely know. It was, it was what the teacher was like, hey, ink with this. Yeah. Yeah, that's most people's experience. What about you? Do you know what you inked with? Was it like a Sumi brush, one of the bigger brushes? It was so long ago. It was so long ago. It's all hazy memory. All right, well, um, Artists ink with all kinds of brushes, as you guys know, so I don't want what I say to discourage you from inking with what you enjoy inking. Um, but a lot of the artists who ink their comics with brushes like to use Kalinsky Sable brushes. Kalinsky Sable is a type of squirrel found in Russia. It is not actually a sable. Some people think it is a mink. It is a squirrel. A very beautiful squirrel, but a squirrel. Um, if you have a problem with your hairs coming from like, there's some dubious ethics involved in collecting Kalinsky Sable. So if you're not cool with that, there are some good synthetics on the market. Um, but I will talk about Kalinsky Sable today because that's what I use. And if you get a good Sable brush, it will last you 10 years. So it's not like you're buying new Sable brushes every five minutes. So um, the creme de la creme, the one that comic artists talk about the most, would be the Winsor & Newton Series 7. It is a very expensive brush at 30 bucks for a size 2, and size 2 is a very small um, brush head. You can also get the Creative Mark Rhapsody, which is sold through Jerry's Artorama for about half the price, and I think they ink better. I brought one of mine for you guys to play with today. And the most common inking sizes would be zero through two. Uh, brushes range from, so zero would be super small like this, to something like this, would be, which would be a four. So they size up sequentially. Next up are nibs and dip pins. How many of you guys enjoy manga? All right, me also. This is what they typically use. Um, there, it's rather rare for a mangaka to use a brush. I think only, Oh, and his name is escaping me right now. But the guy who did, oh shoot, that basketball manga that I'm not gonna remember, and now he's doing a samurai manga that I'm not gonna remember. He uses brushes, but most of them use dip pin nibs. So um, the sort of nibs and holders we're gonna use as comic folk are going to be these, this, and possibly these two here. This is an oblique nib holder. It is designed for calligraphers, for right-handed calligraphers specifically. Um, and it is designed to help keep your writing out from underneath your hand to prevent smearing. I don't know of any comic artists who use it, but just because I don't know of any doesn't mean no one does, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't try it out. So the nibs on display here are a G-nib, very popular for comics and manga, very flexible, bouncy line. A spoon nib, very popular for fine lines in shoujo manga. A browse rose, which is a popular writing or calligraphy nib in an oblique holder. This would probably be a C nib that is a fixed width nib. That means every line you make with that nib is going to be the same size. Very popular for lettering comics. A crow quill in a crow quill holder, very popular for American comics that are inked with a nib. And another fixed width nib, it is probably a B, also very popular for lettering because you always get a consistent line weight. Um, my recommendation if you guys are interested in nibs is, um, so speedball nibs are really commonly available. You can find them almost anywhere. They're okay. Uh, I would start with that because they're easy to find and then I would switch, if you decide you really like nibs, I would switch to Japanese nibs because 
they're still producing nibs for artists as opposed to nibs for letterers or nibs for hobbyists. So if you want a nib that is going to last a long time and perform well, I would go with a Japanese nib. I have a question. What's up? Why, why is it that most manga artists use nibs instead of brushes? You know, I honestly don't know. And that's, I'm, so I'm watching this documentary series by um, Naoki Urasawa called Manben, where he goes and he interviews other mangaka. So I might know that answer next this time next year, <laughs> but I don't know right now. Okay. They haven't asked. And it can be surprisingly hard to find information about how mangaka work in English. And I don't read Japanese because I'm a, a bad nerd. So technical pins are going to be their most artists' first foray into inking. It's what most of us are familiar with. These are microns. They are waterproof, alcohol marker proof. You can find them almost anywhere from Michaels. You might, maybe can find them at Walmart to art supply stores. They come in a variety of fixed points. So I know artists who can get some um, variation in line weight from technical pins like that, but it really requires them going over the same line over and over again. Um, this is what most people start with, and a lot of people stick with it because it's what they know, but I really encourage you guys to explore and experiment. Now, Rapidograph, Isograph, I don't have a picture of those. Those were really popular from the 40s to the 60s. Those are reusable, refillable, cleanable. Um, technical pins, they have, they sort of work like a ballpoint pin in that there is a small metal bearing inside a tube and that helps facilitate the ink. They are notoriously finicky to use um, and notoriously prone to dying. So I only really recommend those if you were like serious business about like, I'm going to be like a 60s comic artist, I'm going to be a real R. Crumb. Sure, then you could use those. But if you want something easy and easy to find and cheap to replace, technical pins are where it's at. What I use for my stuff, and you guys can check my stuff out at that lightly colored green tablecloth table. Um, I use brush pins for the most part because they are economical, they're easy to find, they're easy to use, they give you variation in line weight. You can buy them waterproof, you can buy them marker proof, and you can buy them almost anywhere. Um, Fude pins are Japanese sign pins, and I might have to go run back to my table to get mine um, that's typically used for people to sign their names um, but I really like them because they have very very fine little foam rubber brushes and you can get some nice flex to your line weight and uh, they're available in a variety of colors and sizes and uh, they're becoming a little easier to find here in the US I get mine off of Amazon you can also get them off of jet pens and Pentel sells them and you can get those at Michaels um, Western style brush pins tend to be, um, the ones we're more familiar with are like the Micron brush pin and that is a fiber tip or like tip pins. Do any of you guys use the brush tip tip pins? Okay, well those are fiber tipped and um, artists complain that the fiber tip dies really fast. It gets mushy really fast because when you're applying pressure in order to get that line weight variation, um, it ruins the nib. Now with pit pins, you can theoretically take that nib out, flip it over and put it back in and get a brand new nib. I've never done that. I just use the ones that have the foam rubber nibs and I brought a few for y'all to play with today. And then the third category are nylon bristle nibs. Do any of you guys use uh, a Pentel pocket brush? by any chance? Okay, so that's, they have individual little nylon hairs in it. It would be like, um, do any of you guys use water brushes for watercolor? Okay, so it, the bristles are like that in those kind. And those can be a lot of fun to use. If you're a control freak like me who works tiny, they'll drive you crazy because um, they tend to put down heavier line weights and they tend to dry brush. And dry brush is when you can see the speckles of the paper through the ink, which depending on what you're doing can be a great effect that really adds a lot of beauty to your art or it can be very frustrating because you can't get your line art dark enough and it can be hard to reproduce. But we're gonna, I will talk about all of that when we're doing the demonstration because some of these things are things you have to see to, to get. There's loads of other types of inking materials. You can make your own. Um, some of the other common inking materials are reed pens like these. Um, have you guys seen these at like art supply stores or like Michael's? They're made of bamboo. Uh, so I have read that those are some of the first drawing implements other than um, clay and dirt and uh, 
earth pigments painted on with your fingers. I have read that reed pens are some of the first drawing implements used. And uh, I don't know the veracity of that because it wasn't an academic paper. It was another artist who said that, so who knows? But um, they're cut very similarly to the sort of like, like drawing nibs or like quills where you have, it's been cut to a point and then a slit has been cut and then this hole here is a breather hole and that allows the ink to flow out. And I don't think I brought any this workshop and I apologize for that. There are also glass pens. Have you guys, you guys have probably all gone to the Renaissance Festival at some point in your lives. Have you ever seen the glass blower selling all glass pens? Those are glass pens. Obviously they have um, a glass nib, which is not replaceable. It is a permanent part of the pen. And it's got spiraling on the nib to help hold the ink so that when you're putting your nib to the paper, it flows down using capillary action and gravity. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of glass pens personally, but it is an option and it looks really cool. It's really impressive. So if you are inking in front of a crowd, that could be the way to go. Uh, fountain pens are surprisingly fun to ink with, with the right ink, and they can be a great solution if you're someone who likes to use a dip pen, um, but you travel a lot, like me. Uh, so it's certain fountain pens will have a lot of flex to the nibs, like the noodlers fountain pens, and uh, no, I didn't bring one, unfortunately. Uh, but inside, the barrel holds the ink for you, so you're not dipping it in the ink. You're not, you don't have to bring the ink with you. You just can put it in the barrel of the pen. And gravity and capillary action will bring the ink to the nib. So it's sort of a self it, It's Fountain pens are to dip pens as brush pens are to brushes. So there are so many inks out there on the market. You have acrylic inks, which have a plastisol base. You have Sumi inks, India inks, and then water-based inks. And do you guys like to work in color? Do you like to color your work? Okay, then you're gonna probably want water-based inks and alcohol marker-proof inks. So you're going to, wait, you're gonna want India inks, I'm sorry, and alcohol-proof marker inks. And I have a list of them here. So if this is something that you don't think you will remember, you can pull out your phone and take a picture or you can check out the stream I'm doing, or you can check out my blog later. Um, I have done a lot of ink testing and I still do ink testing because sometimes formulas change, things change. Um, here in Louisiana, your dry time is gonna be longer than elsewhere. So when I ink a piece, I let it dry for 24 hours before I do anything else to it, before I even erase it. The minimum amount of time I would recommend you give is an hour. That allows the ink to cure. It doesn't just evaporate, it needs to bond with the paper. So if you guys have ever inked something and then um, you erased it and it's smeared all over the place or you added color on top of it and it's smeared all over the place, that's because the ink didn't have a, well it's for two reasons. It could just be a non-compatible ink or it could be because it didn't bond to the paper. So um, for those of you who really enjoy doing watercolor, working with water-based markers like Crayola markers or um, the many other water-based markers on the market, I would recommend you guys use India ink. And um, for those of us who like to use our inks in pens, copic multiliners and microns are always gonna be waterproof and alcohol markerproof. And then this is a swatch test to prove that I am a woman of my word. And uh, they were allowed to dry for 24 hours. That's what we're the cure time we're talking about. And you guys can see how much some of these move with just water added to them. So inking is about the inks. It's about the tools you're inking with, but it is definitely about the paper. How many of you guys have used like tried to ink on plain old printer paper and were just horrified with how that, uh, yeah, I mean, same here, or cardstock or just anything I could get my hands on, I would try to draw and ink and color on and sometimes the results were terrible. That's how I can tell you guys which ones will work for you. So Bristol is about the weight of cardstock. It's a heavier paper, it's an artist paper. And we have some here today out on the table. It's available in three finishes. Plate is the smoothest. That is great if you like to use markers. Um, smooth is somewhere <coughs> in between plate and vellum and vellum has a rough finish and that's great if you want your brush to dry brush. 
there uh, is kit and manga paper and deleter paper, and I did not bring any of that, but it is a very, it is a thinner paper, but it really takes the ink well, and that's what Mangaka use. There's watercolor paper, and we have some cold press watercolor paper on the table. Cold press has a bit of a texture to it, and that's the paper you're gonna wanna use if you're gonna wanna paint over your inks. And then there are papers designed specifically for pen and ink paper, I mean, papers designed specifically for pen and ink, like Borden and Riley pen and ink paper, and those are great for pen and ink illustrations. Not necessarily so great if you want to put marker on top of it because it has a coating on it, and sometimes the marker, even if you're using a paper that works with markers, it will reactivate your ink. And of course, the, the list never ends. There are other tools that are helpful if you're inking your work. Rulers, French curves, and um, French curves are, is a set of plastic sort of templates and uh, there are like if you do say like DC Marvel <coughs> superhero style comics where the lines have to be very 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 clean and they want a very specific look you would use French curves to uh, draw all of your curves even like organic curves like the curve of the face and what you do is you rotate the template until it matches the line you've drawn and then you use that like you would a ruler except it's a curved one I, I don't I don't use them, they're too fussy for me. Non-photo blue lead erasers, of course, and drafting brushes, which are really handy because our hands have oil. Even if your hands, you just wash them freshly clean, your hands have oils on them, and those oils, when it, they can transfer onto your paper and it can cause a resist with the ink, which means the ink doesn't actually bond fully to the paper. So a drafting brush means you're not using your hand to brush away eraser crumbs. And then, of course, there's digital inking and that was a piece inked in Manga Studio. And there are multiple programs you can use, Photoshop, Paint Tool Sci, and Manga Studio. I would really recommend you guys ink in Manga Studio for a lot of reasons. One, it's 35 bucks, that's it. Not like Photoshop where you're paying a monthly fee of like $15, 35 bucks usually for Manga Studio, and it goes on sale like all the time on Amazon. Two, it's got stabilization tools, which if you have shaky hands or you're not so great at doing stuff digitally, it'll help correct some of those lines. Three, it's what, there's an increasing number of artists, especially webcomic artists who use it. So it means there's an increasing number of free tools available, free brushes that you can download to do special effects. So there's a lot of support for Manga Studio. So that's what I would recommend. And that, so Manga Studio produces vectors, but it, it, and uh, do you guys know the difference between raster images and vector images? No. Some do, some don't. Okay, so a vector image, no matter how big you blow it up, it will always stay clean, the lines will always stay sharp. A raster image will start to pixelate when it gets too big. So if you're doing, say, like signs and stuff, vector is the way to go. And if you're doing like, like my wooden charms at my table, the company I work with, they only want vector images because their lasers can only read the vector files. So that's Sometimes that's something you need to think about even if you work super tiny. Um, the only program that I know of that will put out vectors as vectors is Adobe Illustrator, and it is a pain in the booty for me. Other artists might like it, but I hate it, and it's expensive too. So there are some basic techniques. This is an ink wash uh, mini comic I did for the Chainmail Bikini Girl Gamer Anthology. Um, and there is dry brush, which we talked about a little bit, and I'll demonstrate, ink wash, splatter, masking, and then corrections. This tracing paper over here is a masking technique to protect the body of the comic, so I can do a splatter technique with white ink to do those stars. And splatter is super easy. You dip a toothbrush in, like an old toothbrush, in whatever ink you want to splatter on, and then you just use your thumb and you scrape it off. It's like being in kindergarten again. It is awesome. And masking, you just cut out the area you want to apply your splatter to and leave the rest uncut and it'll just protect it. And ink wash is when you water down ink or you use black watercolor, which I brought, um, to create kind of different variations of grayscale. And of course, like everything in life, there's an order of operations. I'm sorry to make math come into play today. I like to start with blue lines. That means I draw with a non-coated blue pencil. 
Then I do the borders and let that dry. Then I draw the people while my hands are still fresh and they don't hurt. Then I do the background and then I do effects and I let all of that cure for 24 hours. Then I erase and then I do the corrections with white ink. And these are some terms we're probably gonna talk about today. Spot black, also referred to as beta. That is when you fill an entire area with black. I don't know that I have any. So the background here before the splatter would be a spot black. And this girl's hair and the silhouette right there, those would also be considered spot blacks. So it is a black filled area with no texture. Fill, same thing, but it can also refer to color. Ghosting is when you erase and the ink is gray instead of the color you put down. Hatching and cross hatching, I can demonstrate for you guys. Stippling, the same thing. Line weight is another thing I will demonstrate for you guys. Ink wash, we just talked about that. That is those variations of gray tones. Think of it as painting, but or watercolor, but with just black. Spot color is um, when you fill, I wish I'd brought an example for you guys, but it's when you fill in an area with just like a solid fill of color. There's no texture, there's no variation, it's just color. And then blue lines is when you draw or print non-photo blue onto your paper and then ink on top of that. And do you guys, do you guys know why people do blue lines? Awesome, fantastic, God, well some of y'all do, okay, of course. So blue lines, um, comes from when comic artists, so in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, when photocopiers weren't really very good at picking up color. And it is a very, very light blue, and the photocopiers couldn't pick up that blue, so all it could pick up was the black and the white. So people would sketch with non-photo blue crayons, uh, color pencils, pencils, ink, and uh, then ink on top of it with black, and then they photocopy it, and their resulting zines and mini comics would just be in black and white and it wouldn't show any of that sketching. So they didn't have to do any erasing. Um, now you can do that in Photoshop very easily and I have tutorials on my blog on how to do that. So like we talked about, allow your inks to dry for 24 hours to prevent ghosting. Apply your corrections after your inks are completed and after you've erased because your eraser can pick up that white ink or it can smear graphite onto it and ruin it. Uh, scan at a large format. Uh, I like to scan at 600 dpi, which probably does not mean a whole lot to you guys. Um, it, is, it is huge. I scan huge. Uh, Manga Studio 5 and above handle digital inks better than Photoshop. Clean brushes and nibs immediately in water after use and dry them out. And occasionally shampoo and condition your natural hair brushes with a mild and cheap uh, baby shampoo and conditioner, and you can pick those up at like Dollar Tree. All right, so for additional resources, you can check these two links out, and I have postcards for you guys. And um, you guys can like contact me anytime if any questions come up. And so that is an example of the blue lines. For my borders, I like to use a wide nib calligraphy pens because I can just do those borders super fast and super thick. Then I tighten up my illustration with pencils so it's not exactly what I did in the blue lines. It's a little bit cleaner, a little bit tighter. Then I start inking the people. And I like to ink, like I said, with a food a pen. And I will, once we, I get you guys rolling, I'll go grab one of mine from the table. And then I, after most of the people are inked, I start in on the backgrounds. And you can ink with a technical pen or a food a pen for the backgrounds. Technical pens will give you like those nice, really sharp, clean lines that are good for architecture. But if you have a cartoony style, you might want something a little messier than that. Masking off, leaving only my selected panels, and doing a splatter technique with the toothbrush that I told you guys about. And that is the finished page. And that is my presentation. I tried to roll through it quick so you guys can play. Thank you guys so much for being patient with me. So I have one, two, I have four different types of paper. We have mixed media paper, thanks to Nocus Fest. We have Bristol, we have another type of Bristol, and we've got watercolor paper. You guys are free to use 
whichever of these you guys want to use. I also, if you guys are like me and you get stage fright when you're in a panel and someone's making you draw, I have printed out blue lines that you guys can use on different types of paper and the type of paper is written on the back in case you like it. And you guys are free to use whichever of these if you want to. You won't hurt my feelings if you don't. I have brought mostly G nibs in holders and these are brand new G nibs. They have been coated in a protective oil to help um, prevent rusting. Now, usually you would clean those off either with like a little bit of rubbing alcohol and a paper towel or you could use a lighter to burn those off. I do not have either of those, so if you're having problems getting your ink to stick to your nibs, that is why, and I am super sorry. Yeah, uh, don't leave it so long that it like leaves a burn mark on your nibs or changes the color of the nibs. And I might have a nib where I did that. I do not. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily negatively affect the quality of the nib. I mean, with cheap nibs like hunt nibs, it might affect the longevity of them by making them more brittle, but with nicer nibs it won't. But, I mean, that's not a guarantee. I haven't used the same nib for 10 years, so yeah. I, don't, I don't actually know if there is like a big decrease in lifespan. I have one of my Kalinsky Sable brushes, and I actually have used uh, shampoo to help it hold its shape in transit, so I'm gonna clean that out in some water. Hey Beck, do you want me to uh, finish it? Um, give me a second. And I also brought, um, so this is dried sumi ink that you guys can play with. I haven't even had a chance to play with it, so you guys will get to play with it before I do. I have black watercolor ink, or no, it's just black watercolor, which could be used for ink washes if you want to play around with that. I have Sumi ink, Sumi ink for drawing and manga, and then colored India ink. Two different Higgins uh, drawing ink pens, one in India ink and one in Higgins Black Magic that you guys can play around with. A small watercolor palette that is completely covered in glitter. Of course, it's me. And then I have a bra I have some tech pins. I have a foam rubber brush pin. I have a brush pin with the individual bristles. And then I have a double-sided brush pin with a large black nib and a small gray nib. And you guys are free to play with any of these things. Oh, and I have one synthetic sumi brush. So there's cups of water. If you guys could share them amongst yourselves. And y'all are free, free to start playing and pepper me with questions. Can you guys yeah. pass some of the examples? Yeah. Oh, it's it's okay. really easy. How are you? Um, Fancy music here. Let me grab. Oh, I don't care anymore. No worries. Okay. So spot black would just be like, say we have. And this is the house. So the spot black would usually be on the side away from the light, and it wouldn't have any. So you see how it, when I'm drawing these lines, there's these really speckles. That's what I mean by like a brush, a dry brush. So that would be a spot black, and then this, and this would be like dry brush. So you can like use it to um, imply light in your shadow. Well, so like. I have, I don't know, like, you were going to, like, use a pen, mm -hmm. but, like, the outline, mm -hmm. you know, like, would you want to use, like, just, like, a thicker pen, yeah. or, like, okay. a really thick, like, so, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could honestly, you could honestly, yeah. like, whatever you have, like, you could like, very patiently with, like, your technical pen. But that would drive me crazy. So what I usually use is I just use like the brush and the straight in the ink and fill it like that because it's much quicker. Or I use a brush pen like this because I can fill it like that. So you can see how that's Which that
I'm going to...